After planting eight successful churches in London, Bradford, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff, Nottingham and Sheffield in the United Kingdom and in Lusaka, Zambia, we invite you to El Shaddai Houston. Come and be a part of a charismatic, global and faith-filled revolution that is set to make a mark in your life that can never be erased. We meet as a church on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. at 5633 Richmond Avenue, Houston, Texas, 77057. For more information, call us on 713-780-0600. Email houston at elshaddaitoday.com or log on to our website at www.elshaddaitoday.com. Come and discover your destiny and enter into the realm of possibility. God said to, to Moses, he said to Abraham and Isaac, I revealed myself as El Shaddai, but they never knew me as Jehovah. <laughs> he said, you know, Jehovah is the God of power. He says, now, they knew me as the never-ending supply, but you're going to see my power. And he says, now, because you know me as Jehovah, I'm going to make you like God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. I'll leave that alone, because if I get into that. Okay, let's, let's deal with this. The power of God was present to you. Chapter 6. Notice verse 17. And he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of Judea, Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Notice how they came. Which had come to hear and to be healed. Notice how they came to church. They came to hear and to be healed. They didn't come to watch. They didn't come to shack up and hello somebody. Pull some talent. They came to hear and to be healed. In other words, they had the attitude of if anybody's going to get it today. Let, let me ask you this question. How did you come to church today? Were you, were you thinking, well, um, you know, I never get it. Everybody else, you know, they just, it's like God heals him and him, but me, nah. They came to hear and to be healed. Let's just release the spirit of faith. Say it after me. I came, I came to, hear to hear and to be healed. To be healed. Say it again. I came, I came to, hear to hear and to be healed. To be healed. Now notice what happened. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits and, and, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, Jesus, for there went virtue, power, out of him and he healed them all. Now notice, this is the anointing, burden removing, yoke destroying power. But, but first of all, notice, the power of God in chapter 5 was present to him and they perceived that, which lets me know the anointing is a perceptible substance. Secondly, virtue in this verse was flowing out of him and he felt it. So the anointing is tangible because they could touch it. He healed them all. So it was enough to feed the multitude. So the anointing is quantifiable. And notice, they sought to touch him and there was a flow when they touched him. So the anointing is transferable. So the anointing is a perceptible, tangible quantifiable and transferable heavenly substance. Amen. The anointing is a perceptible, tangible, quantifiable and, and, and transferable heavenly substance. And this morning, the power of God is present to heal and you can perceive it, you can feel it, you can quantify it and you can receive a transfer. Oh, you're going to catch on as we go on. So today, this is what we are about. We are about to experience a transference of that anointing that God has sent to heal every situation, to restore 
every situation. To rebuild every situation. And give you back the years that the locusts have eaten. And to give you beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. A garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And that anointing is present in this building. If you receive that, give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Amen. Now go to Acts chapter 10. In the book of Acts chapter 10, let's just track together a little bit in the scripture. Notice some things here. Recession proofing our lives. Not everybody have to recess. No, the Lord shall increase us. More and more. Come on, somebody. More and more and more and more and more. Acts chapter 10. Let's notice here, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> I love this scripture. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. And healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now notice the anointing was on Jesus for them. This morning, the anointing that's on me is for you. I got a question for you. Are you going to take it? Because here's, here's the deal. Don't let me go back to that office with this anointing. Some of you, how can he say that? Because when I stand in this pulpit, I don't stand in my name. I know my name don't amount up to much. But when I stand in the name of Jesus, I'll leave that alone, man. But, but, but notice, he healed them and he went around doing good. The anointing wants to do you good. So say this after me, something good. Is about to happen to me. Say it again. Something good is about to happen in my life. And it will be because of the anointing. Now let's get involved in this because what we want to see is if God's got increase on his mind, now we have dealt with the theoretical why. Why? Because he doesn't want any burdens on you. Now it's time to deal with the practical how, because if we just know why, we may be able to endure, but we will not, we will not have the ability to, to withstand or even to stop the assault of the devil because we don't know how. How empowers you to change the situation. Still in the book of Acts, chapter 10, notice verse 1. Let's get into this. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared the Lord. He was a righteous man with all his house. Underline that part, with all his house. It's not enough. Some things will not happen in your life just because you are the only righteous person. You got to get your whole house involved. Amen. Joshua 24, he said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Noah entered his ark with all his house. I don't want to enter by myself. I want to take my family with me. And the Bible says when we get to heaven, when we die, we are all going to be gathered up as families. David died and he was gathered up with his fathers. Where do you think he was gathered up? In heaven. Okay, I'll leave that alone. But he feared the Lord with all his house. And, and, and not only did he fear the Lord, but he gave to the people and he prayed. So here is a man. First foundational block. He feared the Lord. He lived right. Secondly, he gave. Thirdly, he prayed. Let's see what the average Christian does. Half living right. See my leg? Half living right, half a giving, and no prayer. He jumped the step. <laughs> oh, this guy, I'm going to live right, glory to God. Don't believe in giving, but I'll pray. 
It's getting quiet in the house. Everybody, um, I don't know what you mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> oh, he's the guy. He just thinks he can give and not live right. I gave. I just don't, I don't, I just don't know why I'm not receiving anything. How about the fact that you haven't been speaking to your mother-in-law? Thank God for mother-in-laws. Some of you says, well, I haven't got any in-laws. I got outlaws. <laughs> <laughs> he lived right. Then he gave and he prayed. Now notice what happened. And he saw, verse 3, a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day. And an angel of God coming to him and said, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And when he, then he said unto him, Your prayers and your giving. Let me say it again. Your prayers and your giving, notice, they have come up as a memorial before the Lord. Notice, it wasn't just his prayers. But his giving came up as a memorial, as something, a token of remembrance before God. God had to think about what he gave. And God had to think about what he prayed. And the both of them, these two things, the combination of sowing and praying, got God's attention. Now, some people will bless the Lord. I don't know about that. I just want to get God's attention. Go to Genesis chapter 8. Let's see whether or not this is a principle that goes throughout the word. You can deal with the situation as it is within your flesh or you can deal with it according to the spirit. After planting eight successful churches in London, Bradford, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff, Nottingham and Sheffield in the United Kingdom and in Lusaka, Zambia, Dr. Ramson and Pastor Linda Mumba invite you to El Shaddai Houston. Come and be a part of a charismatic, global and faith-filled revolution that is set to make a mark in your life that can never be erased. The same hand that started El Shaddai in the last six, seven, eight cities is the same hand that will build a worldwide ministry. We meet as a church every Sunday from 10 a.m. and every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. at 5633 Richmond Avenue, Houston, Texas, 77057. For more information, write to us at P.O. Box 460249, Houston, Texas, 77056. Call us on 713-780-0600 or log on to our website at www.elshaddaitoday.com. Come and discover your destiny enter into the realm of possibilities. Now, Genesis 8 and verse 20, he said, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and he took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered a burnt offering on the altar. Now, let's pause for a little bit. Noah has just come out of the flood. Everything has died. All the clean things that he can eat were on the ark. And there'll be no food now because, you know, it's been a flood. Everything is destroyed. And he takes something precious and he offers it unto the Lord. Now notice verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. When Noah brought his seed, then the Lord smelled something. And then the Lord said. A lot of people want the Lord to say. Before the Lord smells something. <laughs> Let me ask you a question over your life. What's the Lord smelling? Is he smelling complaints? Boo-hoo crying? Murmuring and complaining? You know, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 tells us how church folk do it. He said, he said when they heard the word of the Lord, they, they went back to their tents. And they murmured in their tents and they said, it's because the Lord hate, hated us. At church, they lifted up their hands and danced around. But it's when they went home that they murmured in their house and said, it's because the Lord hated us. That's why it's not working. What's he smelling from your house? 
Self-pity. The sense of we'll never make it. You know, if I hear Pastor Mumba preach one more time, I'm trying to tell you I'm tired. That's why I may not even go to church for the next three weeks because I don't want to hear about lifting up. <laughs> you, know, you know you think like that. I'm not going to church. I'm not hearing anything about lifting up. What's the Lord smelling? At your house. Bible says if you judge yourself, you will not be judged. But if you don't judge yourself, you get judged with the world. So you can do it yourself or you can let the world or circumstances or God's judgment come in. But you didn't have to suffer the, the latter three. You could have taken the first option, which is judge yourself, cleanse yourself, and be in a place where the Lord can smell something. But now notice, when God smelled something, he said in his heart, I will no longer again Curse the ground for man's sake. For the imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I smite the whole earth or every living thing anymore. He gave the covenant of Noah with the rainbow to say, I won't flood the whole world again because a man brought a seed and because God smelled the sweet savor of that seed. Imagine God entered into a covenant. He said, I would never destroy the world because of a man's seed. I wonder what God will do for you if you decide he's going to smell something from my house. And it won't be anything short of stuff that will get him excited until he gets to prophesying, I will never again do this. Genesis 22. Let's just establish this to see whether or not it is God's way of doing things. Because remember last week we talked about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is God's way of doing things. What's God's way of doing things? It is seed time and harvest. To seek the kingdom of God is to seek seed time and harvest. It's not to seek just talking in tongues. It is to seek to do it the way God does it. When God wanted a son, a son he planted a son to harvest more sons. And he brought many sons to glory. Yes, sir. Yeah. Genesis 22. Notice there verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that the Lord did test Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. I mean, this, this I'm trying to tell you, this is not the son whom he hates. Some of you would sacrifice your son. I've been waiting to kill him myself. <laughs> I, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> no, whom you love. Tell your neighbor, love your child. <laughs> And go to the land of Moriah and offer him for a burnt offering. You know, sometimes we read the Bible in idealistic terms and then see our lives in realistic terms. Imagine God telling you to go and burn, not only kill, but burn your son. No, no, just, just get that picture. Not only kill him, but burn him afterwards. This is why people with unrenewed minds who are not Christians, they say, see, it's a gruesome religion. Who in their right mind, because they're thinking carnal. That's why now the devil is doing everything to erase blood from Christianity. People don't even want to teach about the blood in Sunday school because the kids will get upset. If we ever get to a bloodless religion, it will be a powerless religion. Because the power that we experience is because the anointing always goes where the blood has been first. No shedding of blood. God can't visit because it kills us all. And so Abraham rose up early. Would you rise up early? And he saddled his ass and took two of his young men. I'm not going to read all of it, but notice verse 15. You know the deal. He got there. They laid the wood and all of that. And Isaac says, where's the sacrifice? I see the wood, I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? Abram said, the Lord will provide a sacrifice for himself. Oh, let me tell you that. Let me tell you that. Get your catches up. Look up, look up, look up. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Every time God asks you for something precious, in the end, he already has a replacement for you. The Lord always provides a sacrifice for himself. Time you 
sow that seed, you get a tax rebate. Time you sow that seed, you get an increase at work. Time you get that seed. Somebody says, I just had you on, your, on my mind. Time you sow that seed, your idea gets momentum. Oh, oh uh, mm, mm, mm. But, but notice verse 15. But you see, a lot of people will never see that side because the, the reward is on the other side of your obedience. Until you cross the threshold, you don't even see. It's like, unless you'll be born again, you can't see into the kingdom of God. You can debate about Christianity and values and all of this and philosophize about it, but you can never really comprehend the kingdom of God until you get in. See, you know what really gets me about this generation? We don't understand theological truths. A lot of people don't really, when they, when they preach, they don't even understand theological truths. For example, a lot of people teach like Satan and God are in a contest. That's, that's erroneous theology. It's, that's called dualism. It's like God and the devil are battling for this. There's no contest. There's no contest. Satan's goose has been cooked a long time ago. There's no contest. Jehovah is the undisputed champion of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. That's why I never even talk to Satan. I just exercise my covenant right. But because we have a generation of people that don't really understand. You know, you know why? Because we wanted preachers that came to church and gave us something that sounds nice. Religious biscuit, but we didn't give them enough time to dig into the word. To, to let you understand. When I say I'm redeemed, what does that mean? What price was paid? When I say I'm going to get healed, why am I going to get healed? What is backing up the promise of my divine healing? Until you begin to understand how that Jesus Christ, when he was raised from the dead as the high priest, he was went into the heavenly holy of holies and presented his own blood at the heavenly mercy seat and put his blood there. Oh man, that is why God, he cannot make you sick because the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. God has to destroy himself before he began to make you sick in order to teach you something. But because you don't understand the truth behind what they said, you have a shallow understanding of your redemption. So you want to go to church and hear a motivational speech when it is the word in your spirit. Jesus said, and on this rock, the rock of revelation knowledge, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The only thing that hell cannot stand in your life is that which you have been revealed to concerning the word of God. Everything else, all your good ideas, what you read from Stephen Covey and all motivational speakers won't help you. So we got to be, we got, we got to pay attention. This is spiritual stuff. We're not, this is not the same as Reverend Tremble saying, come and sow a seed on the altar and everything will be all right. No. No, this is instruction from your man of God. Yes, sir. <sighs> Verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham a second time. Oh, we're going to get there. We got time. Out of heaven and said, oh, I get too excited. By myself, verse 16, I have sworn, says the Lord, for because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son, your only son, in blessing I will bless you. When Abraham released a sacrificial seed, God called out a second time. He said, I swear by myself because you've obeyed me. I'm going to bless you. And when it looks like you're increasing in multiplying, I'll still multiply you. The Lord shall increase you more and more. That's why people that don't understand this will talk you up. Well, you're just trying to make God like a slot machine. This covenant talk. This is covenant talk. There's a difference between covetousness and covenant. Covetousness is a man operating under a spirit of discontentment. Covenant is a man who sees what his master bled and died to obtain and is determined to make sure that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, receives the sacrifice or the reward of his suffering. I'm not going to let him die and then walk around being sick. That's dishonorable. 
The Bible says when God made his soul, Isaiah 53 and verse 10, an offering for sin, then his soul was satisfied and he made him sick in the Amplified, it says, so that we may be healed. I'm not going to let him be sick on my behalf, then walk around talking about sickness is mine, my arthritis. I don't have any arthritis. He bore my arthritis, my heart attack. I don't have a heart attack. He bore my heart attack, my cancer. He bore my cancer. Now I'm the healed. Defending my healing, hallelujah. That's what this thing is. Ooh. But here is God again provoked by a seed. I swear by myself. Go to chapter 46. And Israel, this is talking about Jacob now, took his journey with all that he had and he came to Beersheba and offered. Everybody say he offered. offered. Say it again, he offered. He offered sacrifice unto the God of his father Isaac. Look at that connection. I'll leave that alone. And God spoke unto him in a vision of the night. When he offered something, then God spoke. A lot of people want God to speak before they release squat. They want the deeper for the cheaper. The anointing will cost you something. Pastors call me all the time. Well, I just want to know how anointed I can, I, can, I can get anointed. There's no secret to it. Are you prepared to pay the price? After planting eight successful churches in London, Bradford, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff, Nottingham, and Sheffield in the United Kingdom, and in Lusaka, Zambia, we invite you to El Shaddai, Houston. Come and be a part of a charismatic, global and faith-filled revolution that is set to make a mark in your life that can never be erased. We meet as a church on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. at 5633 Richmond Avenue, Houston, Texas, 77057. For more information, call us on 713-780-0600. Email houston at elshadaytoday.com or log on to our website at www.elshadaytoday.com. Come and discover your destiny and enter into the realm of possibility. Thank you for watching Get Understanding. For information about our ministries or to download our free podcasts, visit us at www.elshadaytoday.com.